So I think we'll get started. I get some folks to come in a little later, but uh, hello and welcome. My, so hello and welcome to Short Hair and Short Dresses, the United Community in Reforming Women's Fashion with Dr. Laura Payne. My name is Tom Dyler, and I'm the Director of Museum Affairs here at the United Community Mansion House. We are coming to you live from the new library at the Mansion House that residents and guests enjoy on a daily basis. We are thrilled to have live educational lectures back for the first time in over two years. Though we have endured challenges throughout the pandemic, it has forced the Mansion House to become nimble and to make lemonade out of the lemons we've been given. And much of that is many thanks to the uh, Museum Association of New York, uh, who is generous enough through a grant to give us uh, the iPad that you are uh, viewing the uh, webinar at home. Um, in this case, we've also enhanced our tech, our, uh, we've enhanced our tech uh, capabilities and bring the Mansion House to your house through Zoom so that people all over the world can experience community right from the comfort of our own homes. However, that should not be an excuse to come visit us in person soon. <laughs> Indeed, when you do come and visit us, you'll find a vibrant United Community Mansion House, National Historic Landmark, and 501c3 nonprofit organization that was founded in 1987. It's the 35th anniversary of that. Today, it's part museum, part historic inn, and a home for about 40 people. Our mission is to, quote, use our historic site and collections to share the story of the United Community and its legacy which is one of the most radical and successful of the 19th century social experiments to explore pressing social issues that still confront audiences today. All of this is supported through a variety of means. Of course, tour admissions, special museum programming like this one, guest room revenue, event rentals, and apartment rents are all part of it. We are also funded through local, state, and federal grants and the generosity of private foundations. However, our most important source of revenue is through individuals like yourself who donate to help support all we do here at the Mansion House. Today, we are grateful to Humanities New York for funding this program in particular. Before we get started, I do have a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to go over. First, I'm talking to the folks on Zoom. First and foremost, we're trying something new today. It's a hybrid format, which means uh, we have a live audience here at the Mansion House, as well as one like you on Zoom. Please be patient as this is new for all of us and we may encounter the occasional kink. If you have any issues, please use the chat box, which I will be monitoring uh, right over there. This is a webinar, so participants on Zoom will not be on camera or audio. In other words, you will only be able to see and hear our speaker, myself, and any audience questions. But we will repeat all questions to the folks on Zoom who can't hear. Following Laura's talk, there will be a question and answer session that will engage folks here at the Mansion House as well as on Zoom. For our Zoom audience, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your window to ask questions. If you have any technical issues or comments, please use the chat function on the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, we are enabling Zoom's artificial intelligence live closed captioning system. If you'd like to enable this for your own screen, simply click the button on the bottom of your Zoom screen, or it could be on the top, but it's labeled CC, and you can choose from a couple of options there. It's not perfect, but it's better than most. So next, for folks here at the Mansion House, there are restrooms around the corner to your right out of the library door. Your closest exit is where you came in through the front door. However, if there is an emergency exit directly outside the library door, there is an emergency exit should be needed. Masks are not required here. Um, according to uh, your personal preference, you may put them on and take them off as you wish. I also want to inform you of a couple of upcoming events here at the Mansion House. The first is our next concert. For those of you who enjoy Jim O'Mahony, you're going to love Livingston Taylor and Rachel Sumner on May 1st at 2 p.m. On May 19th, we're going to have another lecture right here uh, on dress, but this time we're going to be focusing on the working women of the United Community Limited by dress scholar and maker Eliza West. On May 21st from 9 to 4, we'll be having the first annual OCMH Classic Car Show, which will feature automobiles from Model T's to Cadillacs to Corvettes and more. We will also be having a food trucks and a DJ on hand, as well as guided tours of mansion house. So enough of that. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Laura J. Ping earned her PhD from the Graduate Center CUNY in 2018 with a focus on American history and minor in women's history. Ping is currently the Diamondstein Spielvogel Fellow at the New York Public Library in New York City. Ping's current book manuscript, Beyond Bloomers, Fashion and Dress in 19th Century America, analyzes the cultural and political impact of women's clothing 
during the long 19th century. Payne's article, based on this research, A Tale of Two Bloomer Costumes, what Mary Stickney and Mariva Carpenter Bloomers reveal about 19th century women dress reform, was published in Dress just last year in 2021. And she's currently writing a co-authored biography of education, educational reformer, Catherine Beecher, which is forthcoming from the Roberts Press. She has just accepted the position of Assistant Professor of History at Bellamy College in Louisville, Kentucky. It has been a great pleasure to have Laura here all week at the Mansion House, digging into our collection to bring you this lecture, and I'm proud to bring the Mansion House, bring to the Mansion House stage, Dr. Laura. Thank you. thank you, Tom. And I just want to thank everybody at the Mansion House who is so kind and hosting me this week. They were um, very patient when I got lost and came and found me every time, and also very, very helpful in my adventures in the archives. So I'm thrilled to share today with all of you um, the research that I've uncovered this week and how it relates to my larger research. So I'll be presenting on short hair and short dress, the ways in which the Oneida community was engaged in a larger dress reform movement. So the Oneida community was founded in 1848 by John Humphrey Noyes. Noyes was inspired by the Second Great Awakening and the idea of perfectionism which suggested that heaven could actually become a place on earth. And I think I just quoted Belinda Carlisle's song there, but um, <laughs> the idea of perfectionism was that if we all focus, we can eradicate sin. So if I look at my vices and I correct myself, I could become an example for you. You could do the same and then inspire this person. And eventually we would all become perfect. So noise, who's already a theologian, is incredibly inspired by this idea. And he gets his wife on board, his siblings, and some friends. And they decide to organize into a utopian society. So there are lots of utopian societies during this time period because of the Second Great Awakening. And the Second Great Awakening is so important because it's democratizing religion. So in the colonial period, religion was a hierarchy. Your minister was someone that would have been educated at Yale or Harvard. A regular person couldn't just suddenly be inspired and decide to preach. And the idea of predestination was prevalent. So that said that some people are going to heaven, some people aren't, and it's faded. So there's nothing you can do about it. After the American Revolution, people start incorporating the rhetoric of the revolution about freedom and equality into their religious philosophies. And they start challenging this hierarchy. At the same time, industrialization is creating a surge of people moving into cities. So these people are leaving artisan shops, they're leaving farms, and they're taking wage positions, which means at the end of every week, they have money in their pockets. And it also means that if they want to participate in the entertainments of cities like New York City, such as prostitution or gambling, drinking, tobacco, they can do so. And so this is really worrying ministers. So these two forces combined lead to a series of religious revivals. And because industrialization has also created a transportation revolution, meaning that roads are paved, people can travel by steamboat or across canals, ministers can actually travel. So they go on the road and they tell people about this new brand of Christianity. And so people like John Humphrey Noyes are inspired. And so in 1848, when Noyes decides with his original cohort to found the United Community, he wants to throw off the shackles of capitalism and mainstream society. And he has some ideas about what this perfect society is going to look like. First of all, he believes that because there's no marriage in heaven, there should be no marriage on earth. And so he establishes a system called complex marriage. And what that means is individuals are not married to each other. Instead, you're married to the whole community, which means that you're not obligated to be um, loyal to any one person. You can sleep with whoever you want in the community. The problem being they don't have a lot of money. So how are they going to keep their community from becoming a place where they're constantly nursing pregnant women and taking care of small children? He has an idea for that as well. And so Noyes comes up with the idea of male continence, 
which is essentially, excuse me, which is essentially the idea that men will collapse, therefore there will be no babies. And of course, this is a not 100% plan, but it does limit how many children they have in society. And noise is also trying to sexually empower women through male comments. The idea that a woman might enjoy intercourse more if she's not worried about possibly being pregnant. So how then does noise keep the society from just going crazy? He's worried about that. And so he defines it for everyone. He says, there's different kinds of lust. There's the bad lust and there's the good lust. And sex falls into two categories. You can have sex for love and you can have sex to make babies. And so in doing so, he's creating really strict definitions for how this community is going to push back against mainstream society, but still have rules. And in order to make sure that there's a checks and balances system, he just creates a system of mutual criticism, which is that if any person is becoming too sinful, they have to go before the community and stand to be criticized. And this could be brutal, but the idea was that it's with your best interests in mind so that you can figure out where your weaknesses are and correct them. So with all of this, the Oneida community actually becomes one of the more successful utopian communities in the 19th century because they have this strict structure. And eventually they become wealthy as well. They have a trap business, so that's like traps for fur. And this is coming right about the time that gold is discovered in California and everyone starts going west. So trapping is a really important moneymaker for people on the frontier. And the trap business actually becomes international. They sell preserves, they have a silk business, and eventually they get into the silverware business. So by the time we get to the 1860s, Oneida is not having the money problems that they did in the 1840s and early 1850s. And this is when John Humphrey Noyce comes up with perhaps his most controversial um, idea, which is called stirpiculture. And that's essentially selective breeding. So Noyce decides that certain members of the community are closer to perfectionism than others. So he wants to pair people that are more spiritually strong with one another, thinking what kind of child might they produce. So the Oneida community is involved in a lot of really interesting and radical ideas in the 19th century. So in part, gender equality is one of these ideas. They believe in equal education for women. As I said, he wants women to enjoy intercourse as much as men. They believe in letting women work traditionally male jobs, so as machinists or in sales or business. So he really is promoting equality. And even though there are some um, places where that plan doesn't really manifest as you might have imagined and gender equality isn't 100% sound, it's more equal than mainstream society is going to be. And so when it comes to dress, that is particularly significant because in the 19th century, especially in the antebellum period, women's dress is becoming more frivolous. It's becoming more elaborate. And this also has to do with the market revolution. So as all of those young men are leaving their farms and going to the city to work wage jobs, we also see the professionalization of law and medicine and we also see careers for people as clerks, as factories produce goods that need to be sold in department stores. We also have a whole new type of career path. And this career path is going to be distinguished from agricultural labor, working in the factories, and working in the docks, because people are using their intellect instead of their hands. And they're also making more money. So this is the middle class. Now, there's always been somewhere of a middle class. In the colonial period, they were called middling, and they literally had kind of half as much money as the wealthy and more money than the poor. But in this case, it becomes a much more easily defined social class based on income, and along with it comes a certain amount of behavioral expectations. So men are supposed to work in the public, in business. Women are supposed to stay home and care for the home. 
And it's believed that women are innately better at things like childcare, cooking, cleaning than men. So it comes naturally to them and isn't really the same as work, which of course makes women's labor invisible in this time period. But this idea is also not practical for most women. Most women don't have the financial stability to rely on their husband's income, especially if you're an immigrant, you're a person of color, or you're poor. You probably have to have one or multiple jobs in addition to caring for the children in the household in order to pay the bills. But what's important about the cult of true womanhood is that it's an aspiration for a lot of people. And ministers are preaching about it, and magazines are publishing about it. So it sets this expectation even if people aren't really meeting their expectation. And we can see from women's dresses here, all of the ways in, this is in which this is not practical for a laboring woman. You're not going to go slot the hogs in that dress. You're not gonna scrub the floor. Um, so images in fashion magazines are also presenting this idea that a woman should have such little work to do because if housework's not work, what else are you doing? Um, that she can wear elaborate gowns. But there's a pushback against these gowns because they're not comfortable. So a typical woman in the 1850s would have begun with a pair of drawers. So these are your underwear. A chemise, which is a slit. She then would have put on her corset, which would have had boning to cinch the waist. And then multiple layers of petticoats. So the way that you get that bell-shaped skirt is you wear many, many layers of these, and then you put on your dress. So a woman's outfit could weigh between 12 and 20 pounds. Now, in the 1850s, the wire cage crinoline is invented, which is in itself dress reform because it replaces all of these petticoats and you would just wear one, but you still now got cage around your legs and constricting your waist. So John Humphrey Noyes, has a problem with this. He sees it as limiting women. Women can't be equal if they're wearing clothing like this. And he explains in the first annual report of the United Association in 1848 that women's dress is a standing lie. It proclaims that she is not a two-legged animal, animal, but something like a churn standing on pastors. <laughs> he suggests that women focus on something simpler. And he says, why not the dress of children? Children wear a dress, they wear pantalettes. It seems like you can move a lot more. And if we look, our little girl here, yeah, I think she can move a little bit more than the women behind her. So he makes this suggestion, oh, so it's going the wrong way. He makes this suggestion, oh, so subtly. And shortly thereafter, three of the community women designed such an outfit. So this is his wife, Harriet Noyes his colleague, Mary Cragen, and his sister, Harriet Skinner. And the story goes that they get together and they say, we have to create something. And they try a bunch of styles, and then they come up with a short skirt with pantalettes underneath it. So really, he put the idea in their head. We don't know if he said, hey, you guys, go think of something, or if they took the hint. But it's important to noise that this becomes the story, that these three women get together and they design a gown they want to wear because he wants to demonstrate that women have autonomy in his, his uh, community. Now, it's not immediately accepted. One of the community members, Harriet M. Warden, remembers that when these women show up to meeting to show off their new outfits, people are shocked, some people laugh, some people declare it ridiculous. Everybody says, we respect you for wearing man's clothing, but do you really think that's going to work long term? But within a few months, most of the women in the community are wearing it because it's proven to be so practical. And a year later, women also begin cutting their hair short. So they decide that it doesn't make sense to have simple dress that's practical, a hair that takes an hour to comb out and put up in the mornings. Now, this is a bit of a theological problem. Because according to St. Paul, women are supposed to have their hair covering the neck. But noise has an answer. He says, think of the ways in which women pile all their hair on top of their heads. That's not covering the neck. If you cut it short but leave a little bit on your neck, you're still in line with the Bible. 
So from what I can tell, being that a lot of women didn't sit down and write down their deepest feelings about short hair, it wasn't rejected in the beginning. It was actually accepted. Harriet Matthews wrote, yesterday I had my hair cut short. And she explained she'd begun working in the garden. And part of working in the garden was having her hair cut short for practicality. And she was thrilled because she'd been praying to work in the garden and also that they would cut her hair. She said, I esteemed it a great privilege to have my hair cut for the convenience of it. After it was done, it opened my spirit anew to the desire to please Christ and not to care who else was pleased or displeased. So for Harriet Matthews, this is about becoming part of the community. This is about maybe conforming could be a word, but about being accepted and being part of their family and being given an important task such as gardening that required them to put enough trust in her that they're going to cut her hair. So what does this outfit look like? So I have it here broken up into pieces and then we'll look at some examples. So this is a good example of the dress itself. It's just a simple one piece dress, um, straight sleeves, and pantalettes underneath. Now the pantalettes are short. They're not like pants. They go from approximately two inches above the knee to the ankle, which means they're very similar to what little girl's pantalettes would have looked like. Because little girl's pantalettes would have gone from the knee and tied with a ribbon or maybe buttoned to some sort of drawers. And there are in fact buttons at the top of these pants. Whatever the undergarment was, hasn't survived. But written accounts say that they would have buttoned to some sort of shirtwaist. So we can see that, in fact, the idea that this is based on children's clothing does seem to hold true based on the clothing itself. So our striped dress has buttons and it has a modesty patch underneath because this fabric is some sort of cotton that's a very loose weave, which makes it sheer. So of course you, you want your modesty patch underneath and that would have closed with open eye closure and then buttoned over the top. This is a different dress, but I wanted to show that many of them also had buttons on the waist and they would have had a petticoat that would have been non-starched, very light, and it would have just buttoned to this waistline. So that's really as much to add an extra layer, layer for modesty as anything, but very different from mainstream um, fashion. The one thing I can't figure out is they all have these loops inside. I have no idea what those are for. So if anybody knows, I would appreciate um, an explanation. I assume it connected to some sort of undergarment that we don't have, um, but the mystery, the mystery is out there. So here are other dresses in the mansion collection. These two dresses belong to Anne Cooley Sears. And I know they belong to Anne Cooley Sears because she sewed her name inside of them. And I was able to find a letter written by her and compare signatures. So it is in fact um, Anne Cooley Sears who owned these dresses. Now, the dresses weren't uniformed. They were very clear in the United community that they didn't want everyone to look alike. They wanted women to have some um, influence on what the dresses looked like according to their own taste. So one of the things I set out to do was to compare these two dresses and see if we can determine anything about Anne Cooley Sears' taste. Well, the style is pretty typical of Oneida. They're both this loose weave, gauzy cotton. They both have buttons up the front and the trousers at the knee as was standard. The color, however, was interesting because it's this red-brown hue and they have that in common. Now, I don't know if that means that the community bought a whole bunch of fabric in both of those shades and these are the dresses she ended up with or the color she chose. I don't know if she chose her fabric, but it tells us one of two things. One, either what a standardized dress in the United community looks like, or two, what Anne Cooley Sears' taste looks like. Now, we don't know a ton about Anne Cooley Sears. She didn't leave the extensive written records that some of the other women did. We know that she had visited the United Community when they were in Vermont before they moved to New York, and she kept in correspondence with them. And then in 1854, she and her husband and two of her children joined. We know that she was a hat braider, a silk skinner, and a nurse. But 
these dresses really give us another sense of her. So someone that didn't leave records, we can learn about her from the objects she left behind. Now, part of the reason these dresses were so simple in design is that noise warned against dress spirit, which is what he called vanity. So he didn't want anyone to be too, too frivolous, but they also needed to be neat because it was believed that if your clothing was sloppy, it meant your body was sloppy and your soul was sloppy. So that explains somewhat about the structure of these clothes. I think the simplicity also reflects the fact that they were fighting capitalism by trying to keep their dress costs very low. It was brag about how little they spent on the community's clothing per year. So that reflects not just um, the early years when they didn't have any money, but later as well. So one of the wonderful finds um, that I came across just this morning are a series of swatches from dresses um, at the United Community. And this came from Jesse Kinsley's memoir. Mm -hmm. And Jesse explains that as a little girl living in Oneida, she and her friends would keep squares of dresses they really liked to remember good times playing together. But the girls also took squares because they turned the leftover fabric into books. And that this is something that was handed down to them from their mothers who, when their dresses would wear out, would turn the extra fabric into quilts. So I'm hypothesizing that the dresses in this collection are actually from around the 1870s. Because first of all, if Anne Cooley Stairs is writing her name in her dress, and this is a communist society, the fact that she's laying claim to property means that things are a little bit looser than they were in the beginning. So as the United Community progressed into the 19th century, the rules became a little more flexible. But also, if women are turning worn out dresses into quilts, I don't see how someone's dress could last from the 1840s or 50s until today. Um, it's possible, I suppose, if someone had passed away, that's usually where we find beautiful dresses if it really wasn't worn. But in the case of the Oneidas, they were sharing everything. So if someone had passed away, they would have just given the dress to someone else to wear. But I love this because it shows us the vibrant colors and all of the patterns, and it's really, really well preserved. So sometimes when we think of dress reform, we think of drab clothing, right? You're thinking of simple and practical, but the Oneidas understood that there needs to be something aesthetically pleasing and letting women choose their fabrics and their colors was important. So also in the collection, we have this plaid gown, didn't have the um, pantalettes with it, but plaid was a color that, or a pattern rather, you see repeated in a lot of the photographs. This brown one is really baffling to me because it's a different um, pattern but I don't know if that means it's earlier or it's later or it's just random. Um, it has, however, seen a lot of love because it's got a lot of repairs. So definitely the bow is not original. Um, a lot of the stitching is not original. So that one's had a lot of love. And then we have our striped dress here. So the striped dress is particularly interesting because I found a photograph of a woman, a young girl, wearing a striped dress. Now, I don't know that it's the same dress. The sleeves look cut differently to me, but it's possible, if I'm correct, that these are dated, these dresses are dating from the 1870s, and this photo was from 1875, that the fabric was the same. So you can get a sense of what it looks like on a person. So all of this is happening with this dress design initially in 1848. Now, these dresses are hard to date because they don't change. They wear the same pattern over time. If I was going to date fashionable clothing, I could say this one has a bustle and this one has a hoop skirt, and that would help me. But these, it's always the same. But I want to point out that 1848 is a significant year because not only is it the year the United Community founds and they adopt a short dress, it's also the year that women's rights advocates gather in Seneca Falls for the first women's rights convention. And so at this convention, they sign the Declaration of Sentiments, which demands certain rights for women. We all know the vote, but they also wanted equal pay for equal work. They wanted equal education. They wanted control over their own reproductive rights. 
because a woman in this time period had a baby on average every year and a half to two years. So if you get married at 18, how many children are you having? How many pregnancies are you having by the time you hit menopause? And of course, with high infant and child mortality rates and people not always making a lot of money, this makes women's lives burdensome. So they want control over their reproductive rights. These are also things that Oneidas promote. Difference is the women's rights advocates are looking to go through political means to get these rights. They also want property rights, which doesn't interest the Oneidas because they're a communist society. Um, and the vote is particularly important because that really differentiates this group from other reform groups who think that social rights are more important than political rights. But it's interesting that the women at this convention are describing marriage as slavery. Now, they know the difference between child slavery and what they're talking about, but they're using it as a metaphor, and so does Morris. He actually criticizes abolitionists for working so hard to abolish slavery, but ignoring other ways in which people are in, in unequal in society. But in Oneida, would they have considered themselves women's rights advocates? And the answer is yes, but not in the political sense. One woman writes that she is a woman's rights advocate. She considers herself to be so, but she does not advocate the vote or women in politics. She supports women in business. She supports equal education, and she supports equal love between a man and a woman. So this is something that historians don't talk about a lot, that there is a pretty persistent argument throughout the 19th century that the vote won't matter unless women get equal education, which leads to equal pay for equal work. Because if they don't have independent financial stability, what does the vote matter? Because a man will just tell them how they need to vote, and if he's the reason you have a roof over your head, why would you say no? Work is really important to the women of Oneida, and work is really um, a large part of the structure of the society. Harriet Matthews writes in 1855 that it had become an easy, permanent, natural thing for women to engage freely in all manner of outdoor labor, and in the labors of all the different shops, and the men work in the house with the women as free labor. She said that she felt especially thankful for the love of her sisters, and it exceeded her expectations. So Harriet Matthews, we need to contextualize her life a little bit, because I think there's the question, why would a woman leave mainstream society to join the United community? And Harriet Matthews was single. She joined on her own, without family or spouse. Well, she learns about Oneida in New York City at the home of Horace Greeley, who is the editor of the New York Tribune. One of the community members, George Cregan, is visiting Greeley, meets Matthews there, and tells her all about the community, invites her to come visit, which she eventually does and joins. But it's, it's significant to note that in the same diary entry where Harriet Matthews is explaining how much she enjoys labor, she also says that she heard from her father, and he's in the poorhouse, and he would like her to come get him out. One of her sister's husbands, is in the hospital because he's gone insane and her sister's been left with three little children and no financial support. The other sister married a rich man but he lost all of his money and then two of her children died. And finally her brother is sick. And she's expressing concern but she's also expressing relief that she is really covered and safe in the United community because if she was a single woman she might have to be the caretaker for all of these people. She might have to work in a factory to support her sister or care for her sister's children while her sister went to work, or she might have to marry someone she didn't want to marry just for the stability. And so I think for women like Harriet Matthews, who had a dysfunctional relationship with her family in the first place, whose family was not able to take care of themselves, this was an outlet where she saw it as giving her more rights than mainstream society had to offer. But I don't want to sugarcoat women's lives because there also was a darker, um, a darker side to a man. And largely this had to do with the ways that children were dealt with. Children were taken from their mothers at about a year of age when they'd been weaned and placed in the children's house where they would be raised by the community. 
So the idea was that taking care of children is such a lot of work. Why not share it with everyone? And then it's not too taxing for any one woman. And that sounds really good in theory, but for individual women, it was excruciating to have their children taken away. Harriet Worden actually gets told by another member that she's committing adultery because she loves her baby, Pierpont Noyes, too much. And when Pierpont's a toddler and he's allowed to visit his mother and he's taken away at the end of the day, he throws such a temper tantrum that they decide he can't visit with his mother anymore. And they say, you have evidently got sticky to your mother. So sticky meant too attached. You love one person too much when you should be spreading your love throughout the community. Another community member, Jesse Kinsley, didn't know who her father was because her mother got pregnant on accident. And so she wasn't really paying attention to timing or who it could be. She was in her mid forties. They assumed that was um, something that wasn't going to happen. So that's something that the community members sort of gossiped about. Everybody thought John Humphrey Noyce could have been Jesse Kinsley's father because there was a resemblance, but nobody knew. And they were told it wasn't going to be investigated further. So there is a point where women, I think, lose some autonomy, but overall, for the purposes of dress, they actually gained rights. So the dress reform movement, what does that have to do with Oneida? Well, the Oneida community establishes their dress in 1848, the same year that the health reform community comes up with a very similar dress. And in 1851, the daughter of the abolitionist Garrett Smith, Elizabeth Smith Miller, designs her dress as well. So Miller's story is, she's working in the garden, her dress gets really muddy, she gets really annoyed and in a rage, cuts it off at the knee, and then realizes she's showing bare leg, so adds some pants. Historians doubt this story simply because she lived in Peterborough, which is very close to Oneida. She would have also lived near the health reform um, institutions. But her father, Garrett Smith, knew both John Humphrey Noyes and the proprietor of one of the major um, health reform sanitariums, James C. Jackson. James C. Jackson is one of Garrett Smith's protégés. And so one of the things that I myself missed until recently when another researcher pointed out to me and that researchers do tend to miss is that this is not an accident, that everyone's coming up with this idea for a reform dress in the same part of New York at the same time. They all know each other. Now, none of these gowns were structured in the same way as Oneida. Oneida has a very distinct pattern, but I think the idea originated with Oneida and then people adapted the pattern to whatever they needed it to be. So these two outfits would have had a more traditional pant much more like a men's pair of pants um, than anything that had to be buttoned to an underskirt. James C. Jackson, who is the proprietor of Arkham on the Hillside, which is one of the major um, water cure institutions in the 19th century, is a huge proponent of all sorts of reform in women's dress. He sees women's dress as actually being a huge detriment to their health not interested so much in political rights as much as the ways in which fashionable clothing that weighs a lot, that cinches your waist, is making women sick, therefore making them unequal, therefore threatening the future of the nation. And he has a protege named Harriet N. Austin. Harriet Austin writes so many books about dress reform, and she also cuts her hair short. Now, Austin has a different reasoning than Oneida for why her hair is short. She says, I think that long hair is beautiful, but it gives you headaches, it cuts off your circulation. I don't know that it does, but this is the kind of pseudo medicine of the era. And so she says, if you have bad health at all, or you're just looking for convenience, cut your hair short. And in 1872, Jackson and Austin actually visit Oneida and they stay for two days and sit around with Jackson and um, his inner circle and they discuss their appearance and they share notes. I don't know what was said exactly. I wish I did. Um, I wish they had left me a letter that says, here's all the things we discussed that I think this is a good idea and I'm gonna do it. But we can assume that it's sort of like when you throw a pebble in a pond and the circles 
bring out and then they cross and then they cross and they cross. These ideas are being shared either through example or through print or through visiting, even if everybody has their own motivation for adopting reform dress and short hair. Now, Elizabeth Smith Miller is really credited in a lot of sources with starting the dress reform movement because she's got these connections. She takes the dress to Seneca Falls and visits her cousin, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And Stanton says, that's a great idea, I want one, and designs her own dress reform outfit. The two of them decide to take a walk now that they don't have all of these heavy skirts. And on their walk, they run into Amelia Bloomer, who is the local newspaper editress. And Amelia Bloomer says, that's a great idea. I want one too. So she adopts the dress reform outfit as well. Now her newspaper, The Lily, has a wider readership than a lot of these health reform papers or the circular at the Oneida community. And Horace Greeley, our favorite editor of the New York Tribune, is a fan of Amelia Bloomer. So he starts reprinting her articles on dress in his newspaper and they get syndicated, which leads to newspaper people nicknaming the garment the Bloomer costume. No reform people would have called it the Bloomer costume. That's a press thing. But it's through Amelia Bloomer that it actually becomes famous. And so we go through, in the first part of 1851, what's called Bloomer mania. The press kind of misunderstands the purpose of dress reform, and they think it's a, a new fashion. So Harper's New Monthly Magazine advertises a version as summer wear. We have all kinds of sheet music companies saying, well, look, you can dance in that. How about you wear the Bloomer costume and dance to the Bloomer polka? <laughs> <laughs> and women going west also start to adopt it because it's much more practical on the frontier or on farms. But the bubble bursts pretty fast, and the popular press begins making fun of women that are dress reformers. So their argument is that if women want to wear pants, it's going to make them masculine. So we have the exaggeratedly short skirt, we have the bare leg, we have women doing all kinds of masculine things like smoking and doing heavy labor, and this is threatening. Because if we let women have this much power, not only are they going to defeminize themselves, the argument goes, but they won't be around to raise the children, maybe the men will have to raise the children, and the world will turn upside down. But the press doesn't just stop at making fun of bloomer wearers. They make fun of anybody they deem transgressive. So Horace Greeley gets called Flandrin because in the Tribune, he has allowed for a printed debate about whether marriage is an archaic institution. He doesn't actually believe in that, but he believes in the free press and he wants people to be able to argue in his paper. But because of that association, and because of his association with Amelia Bloomer, the press decides it must be that he wants to support women's rights so he can have a lot of women around him, perhaps several wives. And they also link it to the Mormons. Now, the Mormons do actually wear something similar to the Bloomer costume called the desert costume. It's purely practical. From what I can tell, they kind of steal the Bloomer costume and then give it their own name. But it makes sense if you think of them going across the country to Utah and settling there. Um, and again, the idea is about efficiency in labor. We also, I don't think that's super clear, but we also have um, the popular press attacking racial issues by using the Bloomer. So African-American women did not wear the Bloomer. Um, there are many, many reasons, but the short answer is fashion was power for women who were struggling for freedom, struggling for equality, and not being given either. So wearing something that would make you a joke or make you stand out was not in the best interest of the community, but that doesn't stop the press. So this is a cartoon that's linking suffrage with African American women. And of course, it's a grotesque caricature that suggests, of course, if you empower white women, who else do you have to empower? And not to be left out, they go after Oneida. So this cartoon, Arrival of the New Recruit, is showing very unattractive women in their short dresses, um, mobbing uh, a young man who seems to have just wandered in. 
And this, of course, is um, a strategy that any woman that's associated with reform, they depict as very ugly. Because the suggestion is that if you were pretty, you would be able to get a husband and settle down in a traditional way and you wouldn't need reform. And finally, we have a young man introducing a young woman to another young man as this is my mother, which is implying, of course, that there's um, very young pregnancies happening in Oneida. So, but dress is always prevalent in these cartoons. Even if the text isn't implying anything about the dress, the radicalism is attached to the way women are dressed and it becomes this blanket tool of social control to attack anyone deemed transgressive by depicting them in a short dress, whether they wore it or not. Now the Oneida community is not oblivious to this. John Humphrey Noyes is paying a lot of attention to the dress reform movements. He actually is not excited when it's presented as a fashion, and he is excited when it is clear that dress reform is not going to be the new hot thing. And he says, it was never intended to be a fashion. And he praises Amelia Bloomer for noting the same thing. So part of the importance of the discussion within the press between noise and dress reformers is it shows that they're really not, um, not dismissing dress reform movement as being something associated with them. They very clearly see themselves as the originators of the movement and everybody else is continuing it. And Noyce has a really complicated relationship with whether um, he likes that or not, but he makes sure in the circular, which is the community's newspaper, that he praises the women of the community for continuing to wear the short dress despite all of the terrible cartoons and despite um, you know, the people outside the community that ridicule them. He says he understands that everybody has to deal with criticism because of their social theories, but the women have to deal with it more because their short dress makes them targets. Now, one of the interesting things that the community did to try to spread their message and make sure that they didn't get lumped in with groups like the Mormons was they let tourists come and visit the community. And they always reprinted the, um, the sort of observations of some of these tourists. So in this particular case, um, the quote says about the clothing, every one of these women apparently leads a useful life and free from fashion, fashions, trammels. They have never neither chignons, frizzles, nor curls for range, neither long trains for French heel boots, from the expression of their faces, they seem to be happy and contented with their position. So let's make sure everybody's reading that. So what happens to the Bloomer costume in health reform? Well, the Bloomer costume fails after the popular press attacks it. Women's rights advocates realize that this is going to, uh, this is going to take away from the suffrage movement. People maybe are going to come hear their speeches just to see women in pants. They're not really listening to the message. So they abandon it and then say it was a great theory, but it was never going to work. Health reformers are perhaps the most mainstream successful because they retreat back to their sanitariums. And they argue that reform dress should be worn for health, it should be worn for exercise, or when being treated at these sanitariums, that you don't necessarily need to wear it on the street if you don't want to. And it's through the health reformers that we have the gymnastics movement, the bicycle, and later physical education that really keeps bloomer-like clothing alive. Now, for the United community, their costume never becomes mainstream. It always remains within the community, but it's an important part of their identity. In 1873, when they create the best quilts, commemorating all of the wonderful things about living within the community, a woman named Theodora creates a square depicting two women playing badminton of course, wearing the costume. So it's showing the importance of sport, the importance of camaraderie, but also the importance of dress to their identities. So in the final years of the United Community, the structure that John Humphrey and Boyce, um, created starts to fall apart. And there's a bunch of reasons for this. The first is there's a malaria outbreak and some of the um, old guard were really in charge, die, 
so the leadership is weakened. Noyce himself leaves the community and puts in charge his son Theodore, who's not as great a leader as his father, and people aren't really sure they want to listen to Theodore. There begins to be a censorship campaign amongst ministers in New York State, and they attack the United community for their sex practices. So that also weakens the community. But perhaps most significantly, there's a generational discontent. And I find this really fascinating because the children born in the community do not ascribe to the philosophies in the same ways that their parents do. And this is reflected in dress. In the 1870s, a woman named Annie Hatch had long hair. It's never actually dictated that you have to have short hair and wear the short dress. It's encouraged, but not required. And so Annie has long hair that she's vain about. She doesn't want to cut it. And John Humphrey Noyes is encouraging her because he wants her to give up her pride for her salvation. And when she says no, he tells her what's going to happen if she isn't saved and terrifies her so that she says she's shaking in her shoes. And she agrees to cut her hair, but not because she wants to or she believes what he's saying. It's because he terrifies her. John Humphrey Noyes' sister-in-law, Helen Noyes, who was one of the original community members, writes to Mrs. Garrett Smith, who is the mother of Elizabeth Smith Miller, our dress reformer, and compliments her on a dress pad. And this is really interesting because I thought, oh, is it possible Elizabeth Smith Miller is actually wearing reform dress later than I thought? And what the letter said when I really carefully get through it was interesting because as the wife of a radical social reformer, and the mother to address her former, Mrs. Garrett Smith is neither. Mm -hmm. Helen Noyes compliments her on sharing a picturesque dress pattern and says that she showed it to some of the others and they're intrigued. She says, quote, I'm looking forward with assurance to the time when the pantalettes now worn with us will be a thing of the past. And she notes that she is wearing it to keep unity within the community but she's pretty sure eventually the clothing will change. Now, Frank Whalen Smith reports to Noyes, who by the time this quote happens has left the community, that all of the young women have an interest in long hair and long dresses. He says he questions the girls and they tell him they've always had this interest. Um, it's just now things are a little bit more flexible and I think it's okay to express the interest. So he tells Noyes, no one, only a few people have switched their dress. But this is a rebellion. This is starting to be a rebellion because the girls are also saying they want to get married to one person and they want to have children. So it's a really interesting shift from the original community to the second and third generations and the ways in which they ascribe to the philosophies. And the same thing is happening with mainstream dress reform, by the way. Um, we're all familiar with, let me go back, the bicycle. Nobody really wears this. They wear shortened skirts, but nobody really wears the bicycle boots. It's advertised, it's presented in fashion magazines and bicycle advertisements. But the radicalness that has led to women in the mid 19th century to change their clothes has really dissipated. And women are much more interested in the ways in which the education movement of the 1870s and the new woman movement of the 1890s, which if you think Gibson girl, this is the idea that girls should go to college. They should have jobs. Maybe they should live with roommates before they get married. Maybe they should get married later. All of these things replace the need for a radical dress reform that symbolizes women's desire for equality. So the more that women gain rights, the less they're interested in wearing radical clothing. And this isn't 100% true because the suffragists wear white, but that is to symbolize a message more than it is to overthrow the bachelor of dress. And it seems as though Oneida has also followed that pattern. So what role does dress play in how we understand the 19th century? It, for people that didn't leave written records, it can teach us about their lives, it can teach us about their thoughts. For people that didn't have political Dress is a way to express yourself. It's a way to rebel. It's a way to um, push back against the mainstream. But the interesting thing is how very ingrained fashionable clothing is in the need to conform. 
because ultimately that's what undoes all of these stress reform movements is that women don't want to feel like outsiders. They want to meet the standard of beauty and they want to feel like a queen. Thank you. And just, I'm going to repeat the questions um, so that everybody at home can hear as well as everybody in the house. Century called a story that when the United Women went down to New York City, mm -hmm. they caused quite a stir in their reform dress and would then travel in regular people clothes. Put it, put it um, yeah, the comment is that um, there's a story that um, when a group of women from Oneida went into New York City, they went into Grand Central Station in their short dresses and they were mocked by people that are trying to get a look at them, but also just being volatile and they have to call the police to break it up. So after that, the Oneida community keeps a few mainstream gowns in the dress room. And this is part of the problem with the younger generation is one woman remembers that as a little girl, she was always sneaking in there to try to peek at the mainstream clothes because she thought they were beautiful. And they also are hiring in outside help as dressmakers. So they're hiring two women from outside the community to come in and sew their short dresses. But these women come in in long dresses and long hair and the little girls think they're beautiful. And one woman actually says, when I was very young, I thought, the short dress was normal and I was okay with it. And then I grew up and I realized it's ugly. And then I got a little older and I realized it's in my of social control. So this is something really debated by scholars. Why children's clothing? Is it to unsex the woman so that complex marriage didn't go out of control because everyone's so lustful? Is it to make women more erotic because you can see their legs? Is it none of the above? I know what I'm crazy. Or we have one for online from Laura Hash, who was wondering that the loops of the dresses may have been used to hang the dresses and the pegs in the rooms. I thought of that too, because it sort of actually looks like modern sweaters. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't I wasn't entirely sure because I'm used to more like loops in the back of the neckline um to do that. Yeah. But I think that's a great, a great thought. When we tell this story, there are a number of docents here, we always talk about the women being too sticky with their children or the children being too sticky with them. Don't talk about the men. Men were sticky too. Right. And so I think that's always good to add. Oh, and absolutely. And, you know, the, so the question or the comment was that um, the docents noticed that while there's a lot of commentary about women being sticky with their children, no one criticizes the men for having similar um, preferences for their biological children. And, you know, I always focus on the women's clothing, but there is a conversation happening about men's clothing as well. Initially, noise makes it sound like he wants men and women to wear the same clothing, and that never really happens. But he does want men to wear simple clothing. And he's actually criticizing the other dress reformers for not emphasizing enough short hair and simplicity in men's clothing. And some of the health reformers are saying that, but they're really saying, okay, women, we're going to give you a pattern and men stop wearing cravats, which were ties because they're too tight around your neck and don't wear a tight waistcoat and you can figure the rest out because you're a man, but the women need a pattern. So there is always the other side of this. And this is a time period too, this mid 1850s period where having a beard is actually rather radical. Um, it's kind of a pushback fashion wearing a beard. And by the time we get to a civil war, everybody's got beards. But in the 1840s and 50s, having a beard is rather scandalous. And all of the men have beards. So there's definitely something going on with the men's fashion as well. Or a question that if the, I'm mean, going to last in two parts, Trin. Um, did dress reform use any less, did they use less fabric to construct them? So did dress, dress reform use less fabric? Yes, absolutely. And then the second question, and I'm going to add on to it, this is a good one, but was there any opposition from the textile industry if there was less demand for fabric? Adding on to that, 
was it also a form of participating in sort of the anti-slavery movement not to buy as much cotton? Um, that's a good question. Okay, so the, the first part was, did the textile industry push back? And the answer is they didn't, I don't think that the dress reform community was ever large enough to have an impact on the textile community. One dress reformer, Mary Tlotson, writes this whole scathing critique of the textile industry and claims it's the dry goods industry and the textile industry that have a conspiracy against dress reform because they don't want to lose money. She doesn't actually like name anybody or cite anything. So I haven't been able to prove that there are enough people. Also, um, a lot of the dress reformers that followed Amelia Bloomer would have just cut the bottom of a dress off and used that fabric to create the pants. And Amelia Bloomer's really successful because she's promoting this as, you don't need extra money, you can just do this with something you already own because it's going to be for a work dress anyway. So it's gonna be for taking a walk in the woods. So you wouldn't necessarily have to start from scratch unless you had the money to do so. Mm -hmm. And the other part was... Oh, it does any links to anti-slavery? Any links to anti-slavery. So um, a lot of the women that are dress reformers are abolitionists. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, Susan B. Anthony, they all start out as abolitionists when they are denied leadership roles in the abolitionist societies. They then form the organized women's rights organization and dress reform is an offshoot of that but they're among the first to abandon dress reform because they think that suffrage is the most important reform and they say once we get the vote then we can institute all kinds of small reforms because we'll be able to get legislation in favor of it the health reformers are more their own sect so many of them start out as abolitionists or somehow involved in the abolitionist movement they're definitely all anti-slavery, but they're very, very focused on health. They see the side effect of urbanization as being poor ventilation, um, overwork, um, poor diet, too much drinking, too much tobacco. And they're really worried that that's going to affect uh, people's ability to have healthy children, people's ability to parent healthy children. Um, and that's the future of the nation. So they're not, ignoring slavery for them it's just kind of a peripheral reform oh uh mary joe asked your kind of question did you do you have any information about the final shoe the oc women invented oh the final shoe yeah um so i ignore shoes because <laughs> i started going down rabbit holes when I look at shoes and it's a whole other topic. So I kind of make myself stick with dress and hair, but it's, that's a really interesting question. It's time for a couple more if anyone has any. This is a little unfair question, but are these are, is anybody else doing dress reform outside the U.S.? Or is this mm -hmm. traveling? I mean, unfair because you're not here. You're right. Not so but. the question is, is anybody doing dress reform outside of the U.S.? Um, so I got this the other day at the New York Public Library. Um, and the person very gently said, I don't expect you to be multilingual. However, um, there are lots of other countries that have similar movements. So I know that Germany has um, a similar movement revolving around health, as does France, as does England. Um, and England is sort of in a print conversation through newspapers and publications with the American dress reformers. So they're the more political of the European nations. I know Kimberly Wall, who is an art historian, has written a book about dress reform in England, like through the pre-Raphaelites who were artists, who um, believed that uh, fashionable clothing and cinching your waist was um, ruining the natural beauty of women's bodies. And so they wanted women to wear more Grecian styles. Um, I know there's someone in Australia that was doing a dress reformer, work on a dress reformer that emigrated from England that was very health focused. But you're right, most of my circle are Americanists, so I don't particularly know if anybody's doing, doing dress reform. Uh, 
I have a question. Can we back up to shoes for a second? <laughs> yeah. Um, if you were to do like a two sentence summary about shoe, like shoes, like what would what would be like the general? Um, I only know shoes as they apply to the dress reformers. So the dress re oh, So the question was, uh, can I talk a little bit about shoes? Um, so the dress reformers are very anti high heel for obvious reason. And if you've ever seen a 19th century high heel, I don't know how anybody stood up at all. Um, but they, they have all these practical reasons. They're saying, you know, people twist their ankle, they break their ankle, your foot gets cramped. And so they're advocating, um, initially they sort of advocate slippers to be worn at the bloomer costume. And then they realize if you're doing anything outside, that's not practical. So then they advocate like heavy boots. So I laugh a little because they kind of look like 19th century Doc Martens to me, but they are like men's boots. They're, so they're really saying, you know, you need to wear something that's thick and something that's heavy and something you can wear through all kinds of weather. And so keep in mind, the health thing is important because they have a kind of pseudoscience approach. So they're right about some things and some things they're right. It's a problem, but they don't understand what problems it's causing or they don't really understand why. So they believe um, that you know, wearing really thin shoes, you'll catch a cold and die, basically, mm -hmm. because you're going to get choked, or it could cause all kinds of terrible health things that it doesn't really cause. Um, but I do think they have a point about um, comfort and about, you know, walking around with wet feet, so fun. Um, but that's kind of the extent of my knowledge of shoes. Wrap it up. Thank you all so much for coming, those of you online as well as here in person. Um, besides from being a fantastic lecture that I know all of us to end up somewhere in the tours when we talk about, about short dress, but we also have our, our idea for our next fundraising event. Uh, this fall will be a bloomer polka dot polka party. <laughs> um, we'll have to be in person. We can't do that. So um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, hope you can come see us in person and stay tuned and watch our website and Facebook for more uh, events at the United Community Mansion. So thank you so much and uh, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.